Good morning, Covenant Church. Thanks for joining us this morning. We are excited to get into worship and our message from Pastor Aaron. But before we get started, we have a couple of announcements for you. April is our month to help in providing certain items for our local Christian ministries. This month, they have asked for cereal, laundry detergent, and grits. If you look out both of the main doors from the worship center, you will see these collection boxes for you to fill with those items for the month of April. With Resurrection Sunday coming up, we wanted to let you all know some of the days the offices will be closed. Thursday, April 6th will be closed at 1 p.m. and we will be closed all day on Good Friday the 7th and Monday the 10th, right after Resurrection Sunday. Wednesday the 12th, we will not have any Wednesday night services for any ages. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the church office. Last, but certainly not least, Resurrection Sunday is next week. Statistically, this is a day that more people attend church and even others who haven't attended at all will be joining us. This is such an incredible opportunity to share Jesus and what he has done for us because we know that hearing the gospel just once can change a life forever. Take this opportunity to use an invite card you received on your way in at the doors in your seat or on the tables in the lobby to invite someone to church. Services will be held at 8.30 and 11, and we couldn't be more excited to celebrate the resurrection together as a church family. We cannot wait, and we will see you all there.
Encounter one of these days that will just warp you, and in, in your in your life, if you let it, if you let it, your life will never be the same. Now you can always go back to you and being who you were before if you want to. God will give you that freedom of choice. But if you want it, you can have it. Because the Bible says, "Draw near to God while He is near to you." Why? Why would God? Why would God do everything that God did to get to us? Why would heaven come to earth? And the only thing that explains that in any way, shape, or form is love, 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 love. He is crazy about you, and he wanted you more than you wanted him. He, he wanted and loved you before you knew you wanted him. And, uh, and so he loves you. He's, got a, he's crazy in love with you as well. And, um, and until you have those encounter moments, um, you'll, never, you'll never be called to. Uh, I, I, in fact, I listened to another podcast this week about how important it was. Uh, I love Jonathan Helser. I love when he teaches on worship. Uh, he's raw, and uh, he's just an old country boy from over here in, in High Point area, and uh, and he's kind of like his dad. A lot of you guys know his dad. Um, he's just simple, you know. Just if he thinks God says it, he says it. If he thinks God wants it, that's what he wants. And he's teaching on worship, and he was talking about how important it was for us to have encounter moments with the Lord before we just take off out into doing things of the Lord that, that the, the order of the Lord is, is that you never are called or commissioned until a, a moment of transfer of love happens a transfer of Holy Spirit happens that people that get out here and walk try to try to walk in a, in a commission without a, a, a time frame where they're in presence it's backwards it will warp you it will mess you up it will it will it will it will get you out of order and it'll wear you out and so uh, know this, that the Father is seeking desperately to commission his church right now, but the, the, the prerequisite for commission is, is presence. It's the blessing of the Lord. In other words, Adam was never encouraged to go to work and name all the animals until uh, God breathed life in him. 
Think, think about that. Jonathan tells a story about the creation moment when Adam was created. And it's like God poured together this clay and water and mud and all that stuff. And then, and then God climbs down into the mud over this blob of a thing that he created that, that he's going to call human. And it wasn't human yet. It was just a blob of a thing. And God sticks his face on, on the face of Adam and, and breathes life into him. And the first worship service on the earth was the moment when Adam breathed back. He breathed because you can't worship. You know, what, what, what is worship really? Worship is breathing back the thing that God gave to you. Like none of y'all worshiped before you knew Jesus. Did y'all know that? You worshiped something, but you didn't worship him. Like, you didn't, you didn't worship him before you came into relationship with him. You could not do that. It's impossible to worship him before you're in relationship with him. But when, when you came into relationship with him, the, 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 the response of your life is to worship him, to come from a place of gratefulness. And, and that's what was going on with Adam. He was, he was laying there uh, lifeless, and God breathes life into him. And Adam takes in the breath of God and breathes it back to God. The first thing that Adam ever saw in his existence when he opened his eyes was the face of God looking in his eyes. And, and that's the beauty of it. If you'll, if you'll, the other night, um, Joy was talking about the glance, you know, was talking about that, that your worship life starts with, with what, 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 what gaze? Yeah, that's it. I knew what I meant. I knew what glance. I'd be like, you know, with a gaze, you know, like it starts with a gaze like you you behold him. You know, you you look at him until you become him. You you sit in his presence face to face and then you begin to reflect him. When, when Moses came off of, of the mountain after being in the presence of the Lord, he reflected God. And that's what God wants from us. Uh, but it will require if you want to if you want to fully reflect him if you want to be a complete a, a, a full reflection of him what I was talking about a while ago will cost you something might be what maybe even what this series is about this this move of God where he is seeking to pour himself out in the body of Christ and on the earth in a new way listen this this, this move of God will be poured make no mistake about it will be poured through the body of Christ you understand me it will be poured into the body of Christ and through the body of Christ so that a lost and broken earth will come to know Jesus. He's going to use you for that. So it's really important that you not miss this thing that God is doing on the earth. Don't miss this move because uh, God is moving on the earth in a, in a powerful, beautiful way. So we spent the last three weeks talking about these eight. Some people think it's seven. Uh, I'll explain to you a little bit today why they think it's seven because there are two of them that kind of go together. But these woes of the Lord... These, these woes of the Lord where he's, he's saying, listen, woe to you, you hypocrites. Woe to you, you religious people. Because if you're not careful, you're going to end up missing this, this thing that I'm about to do. These woes uh, in Scripture came between uh, the cleansing of the temple and the, and the cross and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And God is screaming to a religious generation of people. If you don't get this part right, you're going to be so bound up in your religious notion. And you will, you will think you're being the church. And you'll miss me. And so these, these woes were, were, were really important. So I'm going to just send a quick review uh, because I think some of you guys, not all of you have been here for every one of these things. I'm going to give you the, 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 high, the bullet points for the ones we've done already, and then we're going to add these couple more today, okay? So the first thing that we learn in, in the first week of the woes is this, is, is not everyone's pursuit looks the same. Not everybody's worship looks the same, Right? So if, if, if you weren't about everybody else's worship, you might be missing something in yours. For instance, in our church, uh, you, you, there's a lot of people that come up to the front and worship in our church. It's kind of, I, I used to only see that at like when you went to like conferences or something or, or like where, where worship conferences were happening. People would come up to the front of the church. Uh, but that happens like every week in here now, which is cool. Don't stop. I like that. I'm not complaining about that. But just because you're at the front don't mean you're the only one in here worshiping. There may be some people at the back. So if you stand at the front and you think to yourself, well, those people at the back aren't as hungry as I am, then you probably just lost something of your worship. But if you sit at the back and you say, well, those people at the front, they're just a bunch of 
uh, crazies. You might have lost something. So my point is, God can move at the front of the church and at the back of the church, and he can move at the sides of the church, and God can do what God wants to do. Uh, and so, and also, I don't want you to get caught up thinking you're the only place, this is the only place he's moving. Don't get arrogant about covenant or us because we have just as much potential of blowing it as anybody. Don't get caught up thinking it's just in a certain, through a certain type of music or through a certain singer or, you know, that God will move. They're, 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 the Holy Spirit is, is poured out uh, in hymns and Southern Gospel and in worship. You know, we, we, we tend to lean toward worship. Like we do hymn stuff here too, but, but, but just don't get caught up in the mindset. Uh, Jonathan Helser says it like this. Uh, he said, listen, worship is not about genre. Worship is, 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 is about the posture of your heart. You understand that? Worship is not about the genre of music that you listen to. See, some of y'all, I warned you on this on Wednesday night, some of y'all might miss uh, what God's doing in the moment because uh, it's not the person you wish we were singing or maybe even the song we wish we were singing. Uh, sometimes I wish we could just erase all of those little things in the bottom corner where you have to, by law, tell who wrote them and all that stuff because I think if, if you would get a, away from who wrote it, who didn't write it, and just start singing it and let it be from your heart, you might enter into worship a lot better. I just feel like that's true uh, because I don't think it's about the genre of the worship. I think it's about the posture of your heart. And, uh, and, uh, and I think I can worship to, to tis so sweet, trust in Jesus as I can to Chris Tomlin or whoever. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to mention a bunch of names because I don't want to offend any of you. You know what I'm saying? But I, I just don't think it, it, it's not so important about... Uh, uh, all that stuff that we get we get sidetracked with is not nearly as important as the posture of my heart in worship, okay? So don't get caught up standing here thinking those people don't know what to, not know how to worship, and you do. And don't get up standing back there thinking those people don't know how to worship, uh, but you do, because if you're going to end up messing up the thing that God's trying to desperately do in you, all right? Now, with that said... Uh, I also don't want you to get caught up uh, using either one for an excuse. You can stand at the front and miss God, and you can stand at the back and miss God. Are we clear on that? Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, a young man in our church had a, a dream about our church. And um, he was explaining that he was actually sitting out there where you are. Uh, there's nothing special about being up here, by the way. The reason I know that's true because I'm the one up here. There's, there's nothing special about being me, except that I love, I love, I know Jesus, which is the same thing you got. So there's nothing special about being me. There's nothing special uh, about the the stage except this. I'll say this: if you're gonna come on up here, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna seek, from my perspective, to walk in a standard that deserves the honor of being up here. But there's no this, there's not, this is not like a sacred, we don't, I know our carpet's different color from yours up here, <laughs> but it's not anything sacred about it. So with that said, here's the dream. This person was having a dream that this up here was like a big ring, like a boxing ring up here, okay? And the, you people were out there. Well, what I gathered from the dream, and he, we didn't go into a whole lot of detail because he was just explaining it to me is that it's a very good chance that some of you guys were actually going to end up being in the ring. And I believe the purpose of the ring, and he can explain it to me later because he's in here today because I saw him a while ago. Uh, he can explain it to me later. But what I believe the purpose of the ring is, is it, it represented a battlefield that the church is in the middle of. Like, anybody, anybody, anybody know that ever since you came to know Jesus and even before, that there are battles to be won? There are battles to be waged, whether it be for your spiritual life, your children, your job, your walk. You, there are constant battles that are taking place in the body of Christ uh, for different things, whether it's for healing or whether it's for, for just direction or vision or whatever. There are, there are battles to be waged. And so this ring was up here. Nobody was really in it at the time, but the people in the congregation were sitting in circles. It was almost like they were sitting in circles, like holding hands or, or at least uh, just with some fervent prayer going on. And the people who couldn't get in this inner circle had created another one outside of that, which was beautiful because all of those people were warring, just like going to war 
and, and for whatever was going to take place in the ring, okay? And, and that was all good because eventually this person who had the dream ended up coming into the, the, the ring to have battle, and there was a sense that everybody out there was praying for this person. But what broke his heart is that there were, there were also people in our room, in our church, some of them had even been here for a long time. Some of those faces were actually recognizable. And I'm not going to tell you who they are, and he's not either. But some of those, well, he can if he wants to because he's a big boy. But, uh, but, but, they, but some of those faces were people that, that he recognized as people that are in our church, but they didn't join either of the prayer circles. They just kind of set out off to the side in a, in a space. Now, from his perspective, uh, it hurt his heart because they weren't engaging so what can happen in a church, if you're not careful, is that you can get the idea that you don't only want the idea that is the right idea. I have to be very careful that I don't do that. I'm the pastor. And I, and I ask God for vision for our church and direction for our church. But I have to be really, really careful that I don't ever get arrogant and think I'm the only one with the answers. I don't want to get arrogant and think covenant's the only one with the answers. There are people all over this county, all over this state, all over this country, all over this world that are after Jesus, and some of them are after him more than we are. And so we need to remain humble on that, but, uh, but also fervent in our prayer and keep engaging. If you ever get to the part where you uh, religiously think you're the only one that knows and everybody else is wrong, then there's a chance you're wrong and they might know. Does that make sense? Does that mean that that's true, but it could be? But I want you to hold to the truth that it could be that. If I spend every one, as much time on every one of these as that one, we'll be here till 3 o'clock. I'm not going to do it, I promise. So first point that we learned was not everyone's pursuit is the same. Uh, number two thing we learned is our job isn't to impress God, but to what? Adore him. You don't, God didn't call you to live a life to impress him. In fact, you can't. The thing he loves most about you is you. You understand that? The thing he loves most about you is you. It's not your performance. It's not you trying to, trying to, you know, like juggle and do tricks for God. God doesn't need you to juggle and do tricks for God. God needs you to be with him. He needs you to adore him, all right? Number, I told you I wouldn't spend as much time. Number three thing we learned is when we lead uh, others to Jesus, we don't need to try to make them us. That seemed to hit home with a lot of us. Oftentimes, we, when, we, when, we, when people come to Jesus, we want to turn them into covenants. We want them to think like we think, and, and they don't have to, you know, we, you know. That's the way it works in church. If you come join our church, you're going to be like us, or if not, you're going to go somewhere else. And we'll, never get, we'll never learn anything new if, you know, like that happens. We are convinced that God brings people here because we needed them. We needed to be expanded. We needed to be, you know, not, not mean that we're not going to hold to the truth of God's word. I mean, the word is, there, there are things in the word that are black and white, that are clear, that we're going to stand and fight for. But there are also parts of walking a life out in Jesus where your life doesn't have to look like my life. David and Linda are not called to the same thing in life as Krista and myself are, right? Is that true? There are some convictions that you might have that I don't have. Isn't that beautiful? That God can... God is so individually engaged with us that he knows the thing that's holding me back and he knows the thing that might be holding David back. And he'll say, well, that right there doesn't have any effect on David. He's fine with it, but it's killing you, Mike. So you, you, I'm going to do some surgery while you're awake and I'm going to take that out. Right? That's good. So here's, here's another quote. I got this from Melissa House. She says this. She said, be careful that you don't let your experience become the theology that you throw on everybody else. I thought that's profound. I wrote it down, memorized it even, because I didn't even turn around and look right then. I had that memorized right in my head. Be careful. Are you listening to me? Be careful that the thing that you, that you experience in your life, that you don't turn into everybody else's theology. That's good. Y'all should have said, that's good. Uh, all right. <laughs> like we learned last week, programs and plans can never take the place of encounter. It's offer. There's nothing wrong with programs and plans in church. But don't ever let the, the machine cause us to miss presence and encounter. Because programs can become a machine. 
What scares me to death about that is this church has been, we, in, in America, we, all, we can often have church without him here, here. We're so good at doing church and having church that we can do church without him here. A thing the Lord spoke to me, I told you this last week, uh, 12, 15 years ago, is this. Man, I wish I could get back in my church. I want desperately to have my church back. And I'm like, what? You don't have your church? He goes, no, y'all do it without me most times. Y'all have turned it into a machine. And a machine, you, you, you use a bulletin. You take up money. You spend money on what you want it on. You don't even ask me. You do what you want to do. You, you, you buy this and you go do that. And you, you create this as your doctrine. And you don't even ask me. I just, want, I just want my church back. Can I have my church back? I died for that thing. You know? And so we got we to be very, very careful that we're not just letting programs and plans Take the place of encounters. And, if, and finally, the, the, the last thing we learned last week is don't get so busy doing that you forget to be. Sometimes we get so busy doing church that we forget to be the church. The, the very definition of burnout is this, uh, is, 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 is spending all your energy doing and never taking the time to be. Goes back to that principle I talked to you a while ago. God will, God's not going to send you out and anoint you for something unless you're in His presence. Anointing comes from His presence. If you keep on doing and doing and doing and doing and doing and doing, but you're not getting refueled in presence, then eventually what will happen is when you lose the energy of anointing, you will the the uh, the, the energy of of you will take over and pick up where that left off, and you'll end up doing what you want to do instead of what he wanted to do, and you won't even know you did it. You'll start out running in the right direction and forget to get re-plugged into the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, and you'll be out here doing this and doing this and doing this, and, and what happens eventually is you start asking God to bless your plans instead of asking him what his plan is and engaging in it. All right? So we're going to add a couple more today. And then we're going to be done with this. These are the dangerous habits of a religious church, basically. The dangerous religious, religious habits of the church. Woe! There's none of them woes. I woke y'all up, didn't I? <laughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And what that word hypocrite means in Greek, it means actors. You're acting a part, okay? He says, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside... You're full of extortion and self-indulgence. It's, it's a picture. It's really kind of funny. It's, it's almost like when I picture it, it's like a cup, like a coffee cup. And and this person has taken this crazy amount of time to just shine the outside of it. And like everybody's like looking at it like, man, that's the shiniest cup I have ever seen. But they never take the time to look at the inside of the cup. Here's my advice to you. Tomorrow morning when you get up to drink coffee uh, and you look at the outside of the cup and you think it's clean, just take, take just a minute and tilt it and look at the inside. It's pretty important that you do that. Because uh, the outside of the cup being dirty may not poison you and kill you, but the inside of the cup can. Because that's the part you drink. And what he's saying right here is, listen, religious people often take a crazy enormous amount of time shining up the outside. Because we love to be seen by men as, as like holy. We love the... We, we, we have a great fear of man on the earth, and we, we want to be seen as somebody that other people admire and are in awe of. So we'll, we'll shine up our, we'll put on our best shoes and our best, these are my favorite new shoes, one pair of them. But we'll put on our nicest clothes and come to the church and walk in like, man, if, if, if he's dressed like that, man, he... He must have. He must be okay. I mean, you're, we're foolish enough to believe this. If he's dressed that nice, his inside must be really good. And God's saying, "Listen, all of that nice stuff that y'all do on the outside, don't make a hill of beans to me." And he didn't say hill of beans, but that's what my grandma would say. <laughs> he said, "It don't. It don't. It don't impress me." He said, "Don't. Don't try to impress me with with the outside stuff." Okay, blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside uh, of them may be clean also. And then he goes into another one that's similar to it but a little different. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Stay right there for a second. <laughs> Y'all are thinking, what in the world is this? Well, this is a real thing. They would actually, like, 
before pressure washers were, they would actually pressure wash the outside of the tomb and, and, and say, you know, like, this is where so-and-so's buried, and, and look, at, look how nice his tombstone is. I mean, and he's saying basically, listen, you get this? It don't matter how clean the tombstone is. It don't matter how, 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 how clean uh, the tomb is. Inside the tomb is still dead bones. It doesn't matter how impressive you make the outside of it look. If it's got dead bones in it, it's still dead bones in it. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Like, he's saying, listen, sometimes in the church, we, we spend this kind of like the cup thing, but we spend all of this, this elaborate time building this outside thing while the inside of it is still dead bones. We, 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 you know, we'll, get, we'll explain that a little bit more in a minute when we get to the bullet points. But we, we just got to be careful that we're not... Uh, pursuing things that are that are wasteful, that are that have no eternal value to them. You're spending so much time and energy on 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 present things and neglecting eternal things. You you spend all your passions and time, even with your children. Be careful that you're not pouring into them stuff that that's not forever. We we spend all kind of time and effort and money for our kids to have the nicest stuff. But we, we, won't, we, won't, we won't spend time uh, praying with them and encouraging them in the word of the Lord. We, we're teaching them to be uh, uh, people that look like they got it all together, but people who don't have it all together. One of the things in one of, them, one of the Helser's tapes that I listened to this week was, was um, um, there, there's going to come a time when your children don't have the same need for you that they presently have if they're small. But there will never come a time on the earth where they don't need the Holy Spirit. So why not give them, why not point them to the Holy Spirit, the thing they're going to need forever, instead of letting them be dependent on you all the time. Teach them to have a dependence on Him. If you're only teaching them to have dependence on you, that's like a whitewashed tomb. Eventually, that, 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 the statute of limitations on that's going to run out. You hope. Some of y'all are like, no, the Myers didn't. Ours are still, you know, ours, they, they still get money from me every week. No, they shouldn't be. There should be, a, there should be a statute of limitations on you giving and doing and, you know, and making their plates even. I want to say I go to this family union and we, we have people that make plates for their adult children. I'm like, <laughs> honey, what do you want to drink? How about he get up and go get it? Amen. Amen. I, I got more out of that than anything I've preached all day. Yeah. <laughs> Some of y'all got those people in your family. <laughs> but inside they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Okay? Go to the next page. What are you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites? Because you build the tombs. Spend a lot of time on tombs today. Because you build tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. In other words, they begin to build like, they were like putting up statues and things like that of, this is Jeremiah, this is Isaiah, and we honor him. We love those, Ezekiel. We, he said, you, you know, you, you, you put up stuff like that and you say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Because the Israelite, every time when the prophets would come with a warning, they would like stone them. I want to run them off and kill them. They talk about them. They would try to try to undermine them in every way, shape, or form. And they're saying, if we'd have been there, we would have never done that. And the proof that we would have not done that is that we're putting statues up here to honor them. Now, the problem with that is this. They're saying out of their lips, their religious lips, that they would never have dishonored the prophets in days of old, and they're about to kill Jesus, the guy that the prophets were warning of being here. You understand what I'm saying? So what's the problem here? The problem is they got a heart issue. They got a discernment issue. Why do they have a discernment issue? Because they have a self-righteous issue. When you have self-righteous issues, you will have you, you will have discernment issues. When you feel like that you've recreated, you, you've, you've, you, you have figured it all out and that you are now in charge of the, the, the earth now. You're, 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 you're capable of thinking for the earth because you got it right and nobody else can. You often miss the very thing that's in front of you 
when it's right in front of you. Let's go to the part where it says, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. <laughs> so not, not, you just attached yourself on the, on the family tree to the people who did that. And guess what? Because there's been no change in heart, there's been no repentance, no change in you, you're still them. You're bragging that you're not them, but you just connected them on the family tree. So fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, you serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of them will, will, will kill you and crucify, and some of them will, will, will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that, all, uh, that you may content, come uh, all, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, and from the blood of righteous Abel to, to the blood of Zechariah. Now, he did this on purpose. Jesus, he's basically saying, you, you've blown it from A to Z. He, he used those two guys' names, Abel, from Abel to Zechariah. From A to Z, you've blown it, and, you, and you're blowing it again now, all right? Whom you murdered you, between the temple and the altar, all right? So that, what, what's he saying here? He's saying, listen, be, be very, very careful you're missing, you're, you're, you're missing the, the point of God. You're missing him because you, you're stuck in your self-righteous thought and you lack the humility for me to use you in this, in this next wave of, of my move. And I, and I think he's talking to us to some degree that we, we need to walk in, in, in a humility. Let's look at our four bullet points and we're done, okay? It, it's, it's never been about the outside of the cup. It wasn't then and it's not now. One of, one, of, one of the most dangerous religious habits of the church is this, is that we spend more time on the outside of the cup than we do on the inside of the cup. Why? Because we, we've, been, we've tricked our mind into believing if they think we're all right from their perspective, then we are. And it's not about their perspective, it's his perspective. So God wants to clean the inside of your cup. Number two thing, a clean tomb is still a tomb. Quit watering dead plants. That was, our, that was my word for the year. When I thought, of, I was asking the Lord, I was like, what in the world are you, what are you after here? What are you trying to say with, with, with quit, quit, uh, quit, uh, quit watering dead plants? What do you mean? He's like, I want you to, to, to tell the church that they need to be careful that they're not pouring all of their energy and dreams and passions into something that's dead already, something I've declared dead already. I need you to, to tell them to quit, quit planting uh, plans that I've already disregarded to quit walking in those plans, to quit putting energy, time, money, and effort in things that I'm not blessing. If I've declared them dead in your life, stop pursuing those things. You, 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 the, 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 white, the outside of the tomb looks good, but inside is dead bones. The dead bones are the, the dreams that God has tried to rip from your life. And he said, listen, they're not profitable. They're not, they're not eternal. They're not valuable for you. They're not, they're not even what I want for you. They're not my dream for you. And I need you to drop your dreams for you if they're not my dreams for you. And if you keep watering your dreams and they're not my dreams then you're watering dead plants because I can't, I can't honor that. I can't honor the thing that you're trying to do without me. I can't honor the thing because it might kill you, and you don't know it, but I do. So quit chasing your dreams and pick up my dreams. Stop watering dead plants, okay? And then finally, self-righteousness will smother his presence in you. So what, what does he want us to do? He wants us to acknowledge that if it had been us on earth when Jesus was here, there's a real good chance we would have been on the wrong side. If you sit in this room every week and you think, man, if I'd have been alive when Jesus was there, I would have been, I'd have fought for him. I would have not let anybody touch him. That's what Peter said right before he denied him three times. And I'm not saying you would or wouldn't, but what I'm saying is, is this. Why don't, you, why don't you come up with this? Why don't you think with, with this kind of potential? There's a potential that Mike Devine, as pathetic as he's been in his lifetime, that I would have denied Jesus too. And even if I wouldn't have, it was still my sin that put him on the cross. Why don't I have the humility to acknowledge that I'm the reason he died? Because self-righteousness says, wow, I deserved what he did for me. But humility says, I'll never deserve it. 
Self-righteousness will move you uh, into legalism and eventually into a deep religious walk, but, but humility uh, keeps you in relationship. Why? Because humility makes you grateful. Humility keeps you in a space of gratefulness, and gratefulness keeps you in a place of worship, and worship keeps you in a place of presence, and presence keeps you in his place. Make sense? So self-righteousness will smother his presence in you. Humility, uh, by the way, will be one of the prerequisites for those uh, in the next move of God. It will be. And we got to decide, are we going to be humble? What I can't hardly put up with in church is people that think they have all the answers. Y'all been around them. They some in here. I've arrived now. The church can move forward. I don't think God can't send people here to give you special word, but listen, if they come in here and they don't have a humility to them, then I generally just disregard them. I don't want to be mean and rude because I'm not like that because I'm the nicest guy in the whole world. You know, I really am. <laughs> but, but if they come in here with this self-righteous, like, I'm here, y'all are lucky, <laughs> then I usually go, no. No. Because humility is a prerequisite for God moving in you. Most people that are self-righteous and religious don't know that. Most people that are sitting on the outside of the prayer circle don't even know they're sitting there. That's scary, isn't it? Why? Why would they not know that? Because they've convinced themselves they're right and that they're the only ones in God's presence. They're the only ones in God's will. And you've got to be careful with that mess, okay? That's the opposite of humility, all right? So stand with me. Y'all got all of it? Y'all got it all memorized, right? Let me tell you something. If you hadn't been here in a couple weeks and you don't know all those lists, I know I just went over them, but go back and pick up on those things. And what I want you to do, here's your homework. I want us to be a church, people who are willing to look at the hardest parts and say, Lord, is this me? Is this me? David said, if there be any wicked way in me, Father God, show that to me so that I won't walk in that way. Show me my own heart. I don't even know my own heart. Show me my own heart so that I might not offend you with my life. What I pray over you guys is that, that as, you, as you go and look at these lists of religious habits of the church, because we certainly don't want to miss the move of God. Amen? We don't want to miss that move. God, give us the courage to be changed. Give us the courage to choose you first. Give us the courage to be yours and allow you to be ours. Give us the courage not to... To, to think we have all the answers, God. Give us the courage to be humili- to, to be humble uh, and walk with humility uh, uh, as we walk out the things of God on the earth, God. Give us the courage, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit to be like you. I speak over you guys while you're in the safety of this room. It's, it's safe in here, y'all. It's, this, is, this is a place where you can, you can have it poured in you. It's easier here than, than, than at work tomorrow. In the, safety of, in the safe space of this room, I pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit of the living God would be poured out in you, that you'd be baptized and a fire of God would fall in you, that he would refine you and me both. That he would refine us so that we might be carriers of presence. So that as he pours his spirit in the church, we can be conductors of that, Lord, where we can be, have it poured through us. We will never be what you've called us to be until we let you pour it in us. We don't have anything to pour through us until you've poured it in us, God. So help us have the courage to sit in a place in presence where we can be fed by the Holy Spirit. So that when, it's, when the time comes when we're called upon to represent you, God, that we would represent you, God, that we would represent you well, that we would represent you accurately, God, that we wouldn't represent religion, but that we, we would represent relationship, Lord. Help us, God, because we need your help. Fill us up. Baptize us fresh and new today that we might walk in your glory. I pray over you guys as you leave this room today, that as you enter your mission field, that he would protect you, guard you, guide you, and fill you every single day this week. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.